Yo. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start our journey through the various other content creators who started their internet careers on the website known as Channel Awesome, or ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com as it was known back in the day, in part two of this website retrospective. Starting with perhaps one of the most well-known, controversial, and interesting creators on the platform, Lindsay Ellis, aka The Dudette, aka The Nostalgia Chick. To start our journey through the many, and I do mean many, colorful cast of characters and content creators alike that found their home on thatguyoftheglasses.com, I think it's only fitting to first examine the critic's counterpart, the Nostalgia Chic, aka Lindsay Ellis. Interestingly enough, if you were to go back to the Wayback Machine and check out how thatguyoftheglasses.com was formatted, how the content was presented for any new viewer, you'd notice Doug's stuff first in the latest editions, with Nostalgia Critic to bum reviews to video game confessionals, which we'll get to that later, etc. But if you were to scroll down just a bit, the first two names that you would see, the first couple of libraries of content that wasn't created by Doug himself, would be that of Linkara and the Nostalgia Chick. Same thing goes for if you went to the video tabs on the site. You'd see that guy with the glasses, which was all of Doug's stuff. And right underneath him, you would see the dude et, which was all of Lindsay Ellis' content, which put her visually second on the totem pole of content creators, right next to Linkara, who was third. And then after that, the rest of the content creators were categorized under things like Team That Guy with the Glasses, Inked Reality and Blistered Thumbs, all of which are divisions and content creators that we will get to later. I mainly just wanted to point this out to showcase how the site presented its many content creators, and how Lindsay Ellis having her content so quick to access was significant, and it was done this way for good reason, with intention. You see, early on, Mike Michaud, as well as the other people running the site, would start contacting smaller content creators, people who had a YouTube channel or something of the sort that they figured would make a good fit for the site, to further diversify the content on said site. This was a win-win, as on one hand, bringing in new people meant that there was more new content to see, and the more different types of content that there was to see, the more types of viewers the site could attract and thus the more money could be made for everyone. However, from the content creator's side, it also allowed them to have much more freedom, since they certainly didn't have much of that to work with under YouTube's terrible copyright issues and how it was handled at that time. It also meant that they could make some money doing what they love. It also meant having connections with a bunch of like-minded and talented people which allowed for collaborations and much more eyes seen on you than was really normal at all on YouTube. There was also what I'd like to call a fan feedback loop, where people would come to the site to see one creator's stuff, only to find themselves experimenting with other content creators on said site as well, 
and you could eventually gain these super fans that would end up watching near everything posted on the site. And the more content creators there were, the more content would be posted every single day, making it always worthwhile to check back to the website, well, every single day. However, unlike most other content creators from the site, which to my current knowledge were usually invited to said site for making content that was already pretty good, or eventually people joined by pitching their series for the site to be able to join the site's ranks if they believed that they were good enough. This is in stark contrast to the concept of the Nostalgia Chick, which was actually something entirely invented by Doug Walker himself. As noted here in this video titled Nostalgia Chick Contest, uploaded on August 10th of 2008, which I'll play in full now. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. I gotta tell you, I get email after email of people asking me to review shows like She-Ra or My Little Pony and so on and so forth. And trust me, I'd love to, but there's just one tiny little problem. I have testicles. And as a person who possesses testicles, I didn't watch these shows growing up. So, I need someone who doesn't have testicles to review these shows, more specifically, a female. That is why I am starting a worldwide search for the Nostalgia Chick. I am looking for a woman who can make her own videos and comment on the nostalgic girl shows and movies of the 80s and 90s. If you think you're funny and have great knowledge of anything nostalgic, this is the opportunity for you. All you have to do is make a video reviewing something nostalgic as the Nostalgia Chick. What the character is like is totally up to you, and you can submit as many variations of the character as you want. Upload your video to YouTube or Rever, I suggest Rever because you actually can pay for it, and send us a link to your video. Your video, if it's good enough, will be posted on this very site along with all the other contestants. Now there are a few rules that you have to abide by. Number one, you have to make the video longer than eight minutes. Eight minutes is the minimum that you have to make it. Number two, you have to be over the age of 18 to apply. Number three, if chosen, you must be able to get a video to us at least once every two weeks. If you give it to us less than that, we can't use you. Four, you must be able to speak English. This is an English-speaking site, and therefore you have to speak it. I don't care if you have an accent or if you're from another nationality or something, but you must be able to speak English very well. Five, no dudes in drag. No guys dressing up like women saying, I'm the nostalgia chick. No, we want women only. Sixth, all submissions must be sent to us before August 25th, 2008, before midnight American Eastern Standard Time. And that's it. If you want to be an internet star or you know somebody who wants to be an internet star, tell them about this video or submit your own video yourself. If there's any questions you have, just let us know and we'll fill you in. And yes, you can use copyright material as long as it's used for satirical purposes like what we do. You can't just show an entire movie or something like that. So, get filming, turn yourself into a star. I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Are you the Nostalgia Chick? From a business side of things, this move was also done to start having a larger female demographic on the website. Since it was mostly a male fanbase they had, there was a whole demographic of online users that they just weren't tapping into. And thus the contest began, and after many uploads, which I'm not exactly sure how many there were in total, there would end up being a three-way tie of sorts between three content creators who all went by the Dudette, That Chick with the Goggles, and Mars Girl, all looking to be the Nostalgia Chick. First, let's take a look at That Chick with the Goggles, or Chrissy Diggs' entry. Chrissy would end up reviewing episode one of Sailor Moon for her entry, and starts the video out like this. Hey there, I'm That Chick with the Goggles, and for this review, I think I'm going to need more than just goggles. My 
secret identity has been concealed, we can continue. Quite the way the open a video, I must say. The video goes on to discuss some of the history behind the anime coming over to the West, before going on into the show's premise. Sailor Moon hit Western Shores August 28, 1995. Bringing the show here was a bid to cash in on the popularity that Power Rangers was experiencing with boys. Now, the company behind bringing us this masterpiece is none other than... Deke. Who ironically enough brought us a lot of our childhood memories, including the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, Captain N, the Care Bears, and of course, Captain Planet. Go Planet! The story revolves around average middle schooler Serena. I'm sorry, did I say average? I meant retarded. How can that be? This chick is whiny, lazy, dumb, and annoying. Overtime! Quite honestly, I'm a little offended that I'm supposed to relate to this girl. That Serena's not a Sailor Scout, she's a Failure Scout! After running into Luna, a matronly Mary Poppins babbling black cat... I can't believe it! Serena discovers that she is in fact the legendary Sailor Scout, Sailor Moon! Ah! And it's her mission to find the mysteriously missing Moon Princess. So to clarify, Sailor Moon, who possesses the powers of the Moon, is searching for the Moon Princess. Chris does a decent job quickly talking about the show and making the occasional joke along the way, with lots of little cuts to the character saying things in the show to back up the joke. It is her first video as far as I'm aware, and she does come off as rather shy and not very confident in the way that she speaks, and that might also be her trying to remember her lines as well. But again, it is her first video, so it's acceptable. The actual content of the video itself is alright. It's always really been weird for me seeing people review the shitty versions of anime that were sometimes produced for kids in the 90s and early 2000s. Where there's constant censorship, the plot is constantly being changed around to better uh, work with kids in the West, and just generally isn't the authentic way of watching the show by nearly any metric. Like yeah, it's a bad dub and a terrible way to watch the show. I suppose it's fun to riff on for that reason. But also, as far as actually analyzing the show, it's pretty much impossible, and not at all worth doing. Unless you want to talk about specifically all the stuff that they changed and whatnot, reviewing it as its own thing is kind of difficult. She even brings up this point and why she's reviewing the western dub over the original voice actors. Now, for obvious reasons, I'm not going to compare this version to the original Japanese version. If the reasons aren't obvious, allow me to elaborate. I didn't mean it, Serena. I'm not used to being late. I panicked. Moving on. Uh, so, um, what is the reason? Is that clip supposed to mean that the Japanese version is better and she's reviewing the one that's more silly and clearly badly acted? Or is she actually saying the opposite? Here, or is it something else entirely that I just missed? She doesn't actually say, so it's just kind of confusing. Still, for the first attempt, this certainly isn't bad, and I can kind of see why it was one of the more uh, popular choices at the time. Though it does make me wonder about the other contenders it beat for third place. But also, I think it's very clear why it didn't win, and while I'll cover her more later on, Chrissy really wouldn't end up making much content for the site after this, so I'd say it's safe to say that this was simply never meant to be. Next, let's take a peek at Mars Girl, or Kaylin Dickinson's Nostalgia Chick entry, in which she reviewed the banger of an animated film and absolute masterpiece, The Last Unicorn, which ended up being the longest of all these reviews, clocking in at 17 minutes in length. Hi, I'm the Nostalgia Chick. I remember it because the Nostalgia Critic doesn't want to. You know, when you were a kid, lots of TV shows, movies, and toys all seemed so cool at the time. If you were anything like me, you got up every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. and sat there for five hours taking in cartoons. When you heard about one of your favorite Saturday morning cartoon shows getting its own movie, you begged your parents to drive you down to the theater. And when the Burger King Kids Club released a crappy line of toys made in China about the movie based on the cartoon, you begged your parents to buy you enough Kids Club meals to collect the whole set. Back then, it was pretty super cool, right? 
Yeah, well, you're looking at the world with rose-tinted nostalgia. The cartoon logic doesn't work now that you've grown, the movies are just commercials that last an hour and a half, and the kids' meal toys at fast food restaurants fall apart and don't do what they promised. That being said, I wanted to bring up an animated movie from my childhood that I adored at the time, and to be fair, it isn't exactly a horrible movie, but it definitely has those moments where you look back and say, why didn't I question it when I watched it the first time? So, for a taste of something truly chick-like and truly nostalgic, I present to you The Last Unicorn. This entry is fascinating because right from the get-go, Mars Grill pretty easily replicates Doug's format of uh, taking one back to the past to best contextualize why we're here today talking about an old film. Hell, she's even got a very similar setup to what he had at the time. She then goes on to summarize the film again in a very similar fashion to how Doug would do so. Though I should note that there are some audio issues throughout this video with the sound suddenly popping up way louder and then suddenly going back to normal with no real sign of when it's going to happen. Not the biggest deal, but I thought I'd note it anyway. At any rate, the rest of this review is mostly coming through the movie, detailing when something is weird or cool or silly or worth noting and occasionally trying her hand at a joke or two. It's not the most interesting type of video to talk about, but I will say that she does seem to actually like the movie. But because she's copying the critic's style of video format, she never really takes the time to discuss the deeper themes or ideas at play within the movie, which I think makes this video kind of feel a bit empty content-wise. Like, she doesn't really talk about the character motivations, the beautiful animation, or the absolutely wonderful dialogue. As a matter of fact, if you knew nothing about this film before watching this video, I think your impression of it would be that it is a pretty dumb movie not really worth watching, which could not be further from the truth. This was a major issue with this style of video though in general. If they were ever reviewing something actually good, it seemed like no one had the capacity to explain why it was good or look at said film with some more honesty, a more analytical eye, or for lack of a better term, do it any kind of justice. After all, when you look at every old film as a receptacle for making jokes, I think it does start to change your outlook on them, and especially if you're a viewer learning about these films for the first time, through the cynical comedic lens these types of reviewers often had. That larger point on my issue with this style aside, I can also see why this entry got so popular. She is without question playing a female counterpart to the critic pretty damn perfectly, uh, for better or worse. But now let's jump to the last of this trilogy of female critics. The Dudette, as she referred to herself as, or Lindsay Ellis, would review Disney's Pocahontas for her entry, and the video opens up as follows. Hi, I'm your nostalgia chick. I remember it because the dudes don't. And I, like most of the world, am an American. And what's more American than sanitizing your own history to the point where it's no longer recognizable? Puppies! <laughs> but sanitizing your own history comes a close second, and there are none better equipped to do that than the Walt Disney Company. Did you ever wonder what constitutes a blue corn moon? Or ever wonder who the hell would assume that a bobcat is grinning? Or think to ask why he did so? Or just outright like to deny centuries of oppression and genocide? Then have we got a movie for you. In 1995, Pocahontas was the latest big deal to come out of the Disney Renaissance, and it was a big deal, at least in the eyes of Jeffrey Katzenberg, head of the animation department, and convinced that this one was going to get them an Oscar nomination like Beauty and the Beast did. Sure. This movie is particularly special to Disney as it was the first proclaimed to be based on any sort of history, though we have to take that word pretty lightly. So there are already some very interesting differences between her entry over the other two. To start, her sense of humor is, well, let's just say quite a bit different from the other two. She comes out swinging with politics and controversial topics right from the get-go, and honestly sets the tone for not just this video, but pretty much a sizable portion of her online career going forward. Her setup is also remarkably close to that of Doug's, complete with a yellow wall, a pair of glasses, and an ill-fitted tie of some sort. This chick's got everything. 
While that chick with the goggles and Mars girl sort of approach the idea of a, a girl counterpart to Doug being a female nerd who reviews old stuff, which, I mean, yeah, makes sense, Lindsay's approach was to be a female feminist version of Doug. John Smith, or as his crewmates know him, Captain Amazing, is a man so potent he has to get onto the boat while riding a giant phallic symbol. This is fascinating, though again, very much not what you might expect or have expected from the premise of a female counterpart to the nostalgia critic. There is, however, much more to chew on in her reviews, primarily because she is being so much more politically driven and stabbing more into the movie more than the other two did. And some of that is worth talking about, like this comment about the visuals in the musical sections of the film. So now we get into the Academy Award winning musical centerpiece, in which Pocahontas demonstrates how very in tune with nature she is, as well as her ability to, um, fly, and take bear cubs away from their mothers, and turn herself into pastel, and climb cliffs that are now thousands of feet high. Have these people ever been to coastal Virginia? Pocahontas saves John Smith's life. What she does basically stops an execution. Admittedly, not that dramatic a concept for the climax of a film. So... Bring out the prisoner! Sing, guys! We will see them dying in the okay, let's add the eagle shadow. Good, what else can we do? Eagle, help my feet to fly! Okay, wind spirit, that's good. Don't let it be too late! Uh, woodland friends! Yeah, help her run, or whatever it is that you're doing. Oh, still not epic enough. Okay, bad guy, overlay over a waterfall. No, uh, slow motion. Yes! Truly now, we have all of the components of an epic climax. Which, I get as part of the joke, but it's also something that's gonna come back again and again in the future, because it seems no one on this website could stomach the idea of musical numbers being used for visual and well, musical storytelling. She also notes that Pocahontas falls in love with the first white guy that she sees and notes that it's a pretty racist or, you know, bad thing, despite said white guy also falling in love with the first Native American he sees, so... seems pretty equal to me. That being said, she also does make a good point once in a while. I mean, Pocahontas is a really fucking boring movie and does have several issues, in my opinion. But I guess what I'm saying is, is her video is both cutting and very confrontational. Tone-wise, she definitely stands out the most amongst the three. And again, I can see why she was one of the most popular picks as well. Ultimately, it would be Doug Walker himself to make the final call on which of these three women would have the honor of being the fabled nostalgia chick. And on September 15th of 2008, Doug would post a video called Nostalgia Chick Winners to finally reveal his decision. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Well, we've looked over all the finalists for the Nostalgia Chick contest and have finally picked out our winner. Now, first of all, let me thank all of you for your submissions. There's so many a-holes out there that are like, Oh, women can't be funny. They can't tell jokes. Well, you fucked them in the ass with this contest because there were some very, very funny videos in here and a lot of them made me laugh and I think they were just wonderful and we all have fun watching them. So thank you all for your submissions. But enough of me yapping. Let's move on to the winner. And so, the winner of the Nostalgia Chick contest is... Holy shit! It's a three-way tie between that chick with the goggles, Mars Girl, and Lindsay Ellis! Well done, ladies, well done. But unfortunately, there can't be three nostalgia chicks on this site, so there's only one reasonable way to settle this. Catfight! The three of you will wrestle each other in the official That Guy with the Glasses mud ring, where you will claw and bite at each other repeatedly until the winner rises victoriously to the wet t-shirt ceremony! No. I don't think so. Hell no! Oh, please. Mm -mm. No. Oh, fine. Lindsay wins. Woohoo! <laughs> what the hell? You can't do that! Oh, I see. You feel ripped off because you feel like you deserve something too, huh? Mm-hmm. Damn right! Alright, here's what we'll do. You two will battle each other in a giant bowl of jello while- No! Okay, okay. Why not just give you both your own video sections on the site? That sounds good. Yeah, that'll work. All right, cool. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome our three newest chicks to our team. The Nostalgia Chick, that chick with the goggles, and Mars Chick. Girl.
Welcome to the team, ladies. Make us war with laughter, ponder with thought, and give me 50% of all your earnings. What? Nothing. I'm a nostalgia critic. And I'm your nostalgia chick. And I'm that chick with the goggles. And I'm Mars Girl. We, we remember, remember so you know. have to. To no one's surprise here today, Lindsay Ellis won, and the other two would still end up making content on the site, with Mars Girl being quite the popular content creator herself, while Chrissy, well, she didn't really end up making all that much, but we'll get to them and all that stuff that they did end up creating another time. For now, I suppose it's worthwhile finally diving a bit deeper into the past of our official winning Nostalgia Chick. Lindsay Ellis was born November 24th of 1984 in Johnson City, Tennessee. Not much information as far as I'm aware at the moment has ever been given about her childhood, but academically in 2003 she moved to New York to attend New York University, where she earned a degree in Cinema Studies from the Tisch School of the Arts. Lindsay is also a Master's graduate at the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California and resided in Los Angeles, California before returning to New York City at some point. So she has some academic background in the study of film, backing up her content reviews, much like many early content creators of this sort, though it should be noted that she obtained her masters in 2011, so she was actually getting it done while she was also creating content for thatguyoftheglasses.com. An impressive feat. Speaking of, let's take a look at what type of content Lindsay Ellis would end up making over the first two years or so of her making content for the site. Once again, I'll try and not summarize her when she's just summarizing a film, since that is also something she did like Doug for a little while at least. Instead, I'll be talking about the positives and negatives of her content, and ultimately what made her such an iconic figure on the site besides winning the contest, of course. Starting with the very first video she ended up producing after winning the contest, a review of Teen Witch. The review opens with this bit where the chick strips and redresses herself in 80s fashion that I can't show the audio to since it uses copyrighted music. Actually, in general, the chick uses a lot more copyrighted music in her videos, makes for, I guess, semi-immersive videos at the time, Makes for annoying editing on my part, but oh well. After that, she goes on to describe what she calls the formula for a teenage girl, including, as she puts it, a raging bag of hormones, daddy issues, short-sightedness, and an obsession with social status. And if you add all those things together, mixed with the 80s, you have Teen Witch. She then goes on to describe the premise of the obscure film, and mostly summarizes it again very much in the same vein as Nostalgia Critic. It is kind of an interesting video though, mainly because this is a really fucking weird movie. It's a great pick for a review of this kind, as it lends itself well to some pretty good jokes, as well as commentary. Something I do notice though is that the chick often goes into meta discussion of a film far more often than the critic did at this point, which I think is really interesting and kind of gave me more to chew on as a viewer versus the critic stuff and re-watching it for this retrospective. The only problem is I often find her points to either be something that I disagree with, which is perfectly fine mind you, but all the same she has a much more cynical outlook on film, art, and writing than I do. I think that is often done just simply for the sake of humor, which again is perfectly fine. But she often assumes the worst of the filmmakers, or at least plays it up that she's assuming the worst of these filmmakers, writers, etc., which I try my best to never do, since, even if it is just a joke, I find that a lot of misinformation is spread through this way. And again, since the chick was one of the most influential, or at least most watched internet personalities of this time, in the same way the critic was, as noted before, her jokes and sassy comments unfortunately often led to blind faith in her viewers and further misinformation spread online. And then you have comments like these. The most built, unattainable, and uninteresting 26-year-old in the class. But hold on there, 
Louise has to contend with no antagonist. Whatever. I think this was a thing in the 80s. Movies about teenagers, your 16 candleses, your breakfast clubs, basically anything that pertained to Molly Ringwald wasn't about plot so much as finding yourself or something. Oh, and getting a boyfriend. Which is just straight up wrong. For one, Breakfast Club has an antagonist in Vice Principal Richard Dick Vernon. Secondly, the film does have a plot. It's just the plot that takes place in one location. It's about a group of teens from different backgrounds finding commonality in their struggles, as well as giving their perspectives from their different social statuses and walks of life. Again, maybe it's just a joke, but it feels so regressive and needlessly cynical to summarize a film with such great characters as not having a plot because it's purely character driven. I was never much of a fan when the critic did this type of commentary either, but having watched through the first two years of the chick's content, I find that she definitely does this far more often. Anyway, incorrect comment aside, this review is still pretty alright. The next Nostalgia Chick video would be a review of Don Bluth's Anastasia. And every time Don Bluth is brought up by the Nostalgia Chick, you can be sure that there's going to be some Don Bluth slander going on. I'm not sure if she just had a general distaste for the man's work, or it was just a strange coincidence, but all the same, her early internet career was certainly connected with Don Bluth, up uh, long of Disney films, I suppose. That being said, her video opens up like this. Hi, I'm your nostalgia chick, and my glasses have been taken by communists. But it's okay, because I got new ones. Now when we think of countries whose political and social histories kind of make your brain hurt, what's the first ones that come to mind? I mean, besides mine. Russia. Russia has one of the most complex, painful, and painfully complex political histories in all the world. There's hardly a time when there's not some kind of revolt, revolution, invasion, or genocide going down over there. So whose bright idea was it to make a kids movie about the Russian Revolution? Don Bluth. Now being fair, Anastasia is one of those films that, as a historical piece, is kind of silly and dumb. And I'd say it's best to look at the film as kind of a historical what-if story. But I can understand why this can be a big ask for some. However, when you have a film with such beautiful animation, sweeping and magical musical numbers, and it's overall a pretty fun time, I personally can look past the historical inaccuracies and look at the film more objectively as a story, even if historically it is objectively incorrect. It kind of reminds me of the animated film Balto, which is also a film laden with historical inaccuracies, which plenty of people have made huge videos discussing and dissecting, to the point that the actual film itself, as its own piece of art, as a story all its own, is kind of not talked about all that much. And again, I think Balto is a great film, not perfect by any means, but certainly worth talking about all its own. And while it's very interesting and, yes, very much worth knowing the actual history behind the film, that history and how accurate or inaccurate the film is to it plays no actual role in my enjoyment of the film. I guess I kind of look at it like this. The Shining, for example, is a movie that is based on a book. However, as an adaptation of the book, it it's pretty poor, as it completely is different in most cases and just doesn't have really much of the book in there besides the setting and some key elements. But as its own piece of art, as its own film, it is amazing. And I personally look at films that are based on historical events as their own things, before I look at it as an adaptation. I understand that it is a little bit different, since history is actually stories of real people and uh, adaptation of a book is just, well, fiction adapting fiction. But my point is, is I think it's important in those cases to look at it from both perspectives, both from a historical standpoint as well as a story all of its own standpoint. Obviously, after all this buildup, this is something the chick cannot look past, and is the main talking point of her review. 
with much of it being a history lesson in Russian politics and a truth behind the man known as Rasputin, often with her getting phone calls in this ongoing bit where Rasputin is mad and telling her that this isn't the way that it happened and that the movie is misrepresenting him, etc, etc. Slender! Oh, hi Rasputin. I was dead even before the revolution took place! I know, I know. I was always on good terms with the royal family. I had nothing to do with fanning any flames of unhappiness. Actually, you kind of did. See, you're creepy and you have that beard. I only wanted a Russia of flowers and rainbows where children sang and danced in lollipop fields of happiness. Rasputin of the movie basically plays off the myths of Rasputin as an evil-ish scary mystic. The real Rasputin was way, way more interesting than anything portrayed in the movie, but due to the fact that we're restrained by Disney ripoff conventions, Rasputin gets the biggest shaft. <laughs> in reality, he was a poor peasant monk who got in good with the royal family by seemingly having the ability to heal the young hemophiliac Tsarevich Alexei. In the movie, he was their, uh, scary looking confidant. I am your confidant! So I guess he knows all of their dirtiest secrets? In reality, he was always pretty tight with the royal family, particularly the Empress and the kids. In the movie, he hates them and wants them to die. You and your family will die! Now, I actually don't mind this, as it is still very interesting to know the history behind a film like this, and where it obviously differs from reality. And it is also kind of an interesting angle for a video of this sort at this time especially because maybe not as many people knew about these historical inaccuracies. And to her credit, she does point out some of the more objectively good aspects of the film, such as the animation, the musical score, though she does shit all over uh, the Dark of the Night, which, I'm sorry, is just a banger of a villain song I don't know how you could hate. But terrible opinion aside, is at least an interesting video. Oh, and also there's an obligatory Michael Bay explosion joke. Getting to know each other, having sexual tension, learning about the past, and of course having epic explosion-ridden action sequences. Michael Bay would be proud. Man, I remember back in the day when movie reviews consisted of referencing pop culture memes while ragging on films for their pop culture references. Good times. Regardless of my thoughts, I do think on an objective level, the Chicks format is starting to really differentiate itself from the critic style more and more of each video, and will continue down this path until it is entirely a different format. There is still, at this point, the synopsis of the film, uh, showcasing all the events of said film in a linear fashion, but she often pulls from outside the film and into the politics history and more metatextual context of the films that she reviews even as early as this point. It's interesting and especially for the time, I'm not sure if there is very much like it to be honest. Her writing style also tends to be far more biting than the critics, and there is much more intellectual language and ideas being presented. There is also a lot of sarcasm and irony laced within her comedy style. And also, and Bear in mind, I don't say this as an insult or a compliment, just as a general observation. I notice her writing style of this point is very reminiscent of a college paper, especially the type of college papers I would need to read through and review to cite as sources for my own papers as an English major. There's just a tone and style to it that I can clearly see even in these first few videos. A note which I'd like to expand upon a little bit later. After that video, she would end up reviewing the She-Ra film, as well as the Hocus Pocus movie, uh, both of which are decent enough reviews. The She-Ra film is clearly shit, and uh, it's a pretty decent review from her coming over it, and the Hocus Pocus one was rather interesting, uh, mainly because it was a movie that I did grow up with as a kid around Halloween time. And so it was interesting seeing someone review it for the first time. Though I will say, anytime the chick has a skit in her videos, I find that she cuts away to it far, far too often. Like her phone calls with Rasputin in the Anastasia video got really old, especially after like the fifth or sixth time, I forget how many times she did it, but it got really boring after a while. And in the Hocus Pocus review, 
She has this skit where every time she says the word version, this thunder will strike in her video, which again, after like the 20th or 30th fucking time was getting super annoying to listen to. Next, we have our first top 11 list from the chick, that being the top 11 villainesses. This is probably her best video yet, in my opinion. For one, it is kind of a nice change of pace to see her being positive about something. She also has this little thing at the end of each villainess entry, where she names their motivation, which I think is a clever little addition to the format. She also has a based choice entry in having Demona from Disney's Gargoyles as one of the top picks, which I would agree is one of my own personal favorite female villains. Here we have yet another blue-skinned ginger who's motivated by revenge and bigotry against humans. Seems to be a thing. Demona is very dark, even by Disney standards. I mean, this bitch just kills willy-nilly. And what's more, she enjoys it. Plus, she's a little bitter that her man's a pansy. Hi. Angel of the night. My angel of the night. Once the love interest of our maid, of course, years and years of horribleness later, she's pretty much the main antagonist of the show. Well, her and Riker over here. The Vikings destroyed my clan. She's hurt and she's bitter and she's just so alone. The access code is alone. <laughs> Though, this is also the video that this rather infamous clip about The Little Mermaid comes from. I hate this movie. I really do. I sold my soul for a vagina and a man I don't know. So it really does say something when the one redeeming factor in your movie is the villain. Seems like Disney does that a lot. Not only did this shit all over The Little Mermaid, but Hercules as well? Man, when it comes to animation, I must say that in general, the chick just has some of the worst takes imaginable. Like absolute sewer dweller levels of shit takes. <clears throat> in, uh, in my opinion, of course. I won't go into this now, but the Little Mermaid comment is something that is going to come back later. And it's going to be something of a character defining moment for Lindsay Ellis as well. That aside though, this is one of her better videos of this time. Next, she would review Spice World with it opening on the topic of feminism, specifically third wave feminism, as well as going into the movie potentially promoting the idea that objectifying the opposite sex is fine if it's women objectifying men, and that the whole thing is full of stereotypes, etc. Then, she would have a Christmas special in the form of a top 10 disturbing and inescapable Christmas songs. This video is mostly noteworthy because it would be the first to introduce Lindsay's friend, Nella, who would become a mainstay in her content going forward, as well as another friend of hers, Elisa Hansen. Nella, aka Antonella in Sarah, is a former college roommate of Lindsay's during their freshman and sophomore year. She would become a sort of strange sidekick for the nostalgia chick, playing this best friend who was often tormented and used as a punching bag by the chick. I think she's a pretty good addition to the show, and kind of gave the character of the chick a bit more to do. Speaking of that, I suppose I should note that while the line between character and real opinions are sometimes blurred, usually there is a distinct line drawn between, say, the character of the critic and Doug Walker the person though it is less defined than, say, James Rolfe the person and the angry video game nerd the character. Well, on this sort of spectrum, the chick definitely has one of the most non-existent lines there is. I say this because obviously while we are going in a linear order through the events of these content creators, I do have the wealth of knowledge knowing where they stand now, where they ended up going. And while Doug has had many series over the years, as well as interviews and behind the scenes content, specifically made for showing his real feelings on shows, movies, etc., and expressing that these are generally quite different between his own actual takes on a movie versus what his character's takes are on a movie, especially since he notes that the critic will often say the thing that is more extreme or more funny for the sake of laughs, 
while Doug usually has a much more a nuanced stance on a show or film, usually. Lindsay Ellis, on the other hand, well, the thoughts you see in these videos are unequivocally hers. There might be a slight bit of exaggeration here and there, and her opinions certainly might have changed a bit or even drastically over time. It is still, nonetheless, much more apparent that the thoughts you see in these videos are unequivocally hers. And even without the knowledge of where she stands now, you could already sort of tell since the chick's form of commentary is less about the actual narrative of the film and making jokes, and more so about the historical, thematic, and political context surrounding a film, or even her perceived motives of why a film was made to begin with, which I imagine would be far more difficult to not just be honest when discussing. Again, obviously there is some showmanship and a good amount of sarcasm and humor thrown in, but the opinions and the critical parts of her videos, the parts that we're really honing in on on this retrospective, are the thoughts of Lindsay Ellis, not the character, the nostalgia chick. So her introducing skits with Nella, where she's kind of allowed to be more of a persona, to be a bit more of a character, which as a character she's usually very dismissive and abusive to her friends and what have you, is an interesting change of pace. Anyway, the actual top 10 list is mostly her pointing out some Christmas songs that either have funny lyrics that she finds disturbing, lyrics that she finds annoying, or lyrics that she doesn't like because, uh, it's Christmas and she doesn't like Christmas and cynicism is funny, I guess. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Nella is first introduced by uh, being beat up by one of the other friends in their group, Brian, in this recreation of one of the song's lyrics, which is actually pretty funny. Skipping through a bit, she then reviewed Labyrinth, talked about David Bowie's dick, phallus symbols, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, obviously she also summarized the movie, and she thought it was lovably weird, but uh, yeah, she really focused on David Bowie's dick in this one. So uh, moving on, I suppose. Next she reviewed Thumbelina, without a doubt one of Don Bluth's worst films. Hi, I'm your nostalgia chick, and oh. Is it Don Bluth time again already? I'd like to propose a theory. The profitability and quality of any given Don Bluth movie is in inverse proportion to how well the Disney company is doing. This includes Pixar. Think about it. Don Bluth peaked pretty early. His first feature, The Secret of Nim, is not only widely considered his opus, but came out in 1982 when the Disney Animation Studio was in the pits. They were making nothing. So not only was Don Bluth in the bank, he actually got to make movies that didn't suck. Man, I would have been completely on board with you shitting on this movie, but uh, she seriously just had the shit all over Fox and the Hound. Ah, <sighs> that terribly offensive remark aside, Thumbelina is, as I said, a pretty bad film. So the chick does a decent job breaking it down and why it is pretty bad. She also remarks about hating Little Mermaid again and remarks about its significance in the Disney Renaissance. I'm gonna get on a small pedestal and say my piece. It was not the Little Mermaid that caused the Disney Renaissance. Not really. That honor belongs to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The Little Mermaid just put that godforsaken Disney musical 90s formula in place. Holy shit, that is some of the biggest cope I have ever seen. But interestingly enough, at the end of this episode, she asked her audience to decide what her new catchphrase should be. I'm your nostalgia chick, and I need a new catchphrase. Oh, right. Her catchphrase. <laughs> I guess I forgot to mention it up to this point. I'm your nostalgia chick. I remember it because the dudes don't. I'm your nostalgia chick. I remember it because the dudes don't. I'm your nostalgia chick. I remember it because the dudes don't. I remember it because the dudes don't. It's a pretty basic variation on Doug's catchphrase. But after a while, I think she started to realize that a ton of the stuff that she was reviewing wasn't actually specific to girls at all, and many dudes, in fact, do remember it. I think it's also a bit of a condescending twist, this version of the uh, catchphrase. Now, I'm not saying that that's totally intentional, but you see, 
The critic man, he remembers it so I don't have to. He's doing me a solid. He's being a bro. He's letting me know all about this shit so I don't have to remember it. He's not judging me, he's telling me a story. But the chick, the chick remembers it because I, a guy, a man, do not. This catchphrase is judging me. I'm, I'm frankly being reprimanded. I am of course mostly joking, but point is, I guess I can see why she quickly decided to change it this early on. And by the end of her next episode, a review of the TV show The Babysitter's Club, she would end up reading some of those suggestions as seen here. Here, I believe, is where I would normally sign off and leave you with a catchphrase. But as I was looking over all the suggestions that you guys gave me, I realized far be it for me to pick just one. And I don't think that really fits anyway. But I did get some really funny ones, so I'm going to leave you right now with some of my favorites. I'm your Nostalgia Chick, and I have a subplot too. In the end though, she just decided to not have a catchphrase at all. I've also begun to notice certain types of jokes becoming quite prevalent within the chick's content. The first example, and actually where I got quite a few chuckles out of the show, are the times where she randomly has these bouts of spitefulness, as well as her general hatred towards children. If you're between the ages of 13 and 30 and possess that which most know as vagina, Odds are that the Babysitter's Club had some sort of bearing on your life. The franchise was primarily books, and my god, if they weren't a fucking brilliant cash-making machine. On the one hand, they encouraged young girls to read by way of having a bunch of entrepreneurial teenagers doing something super fucking girly. Namely... Caretaking. I don't happen to know what, what little fuzzy insects and small children have in common. They suck your blood? Meanwhile, back at camp, the movie does a good job of illustrating how truly evil children are. Certainly more evil than our inept antagonists. That being only the most memorable thing in this hell stew of tribbles, goblins, ugly babies, Don Quixote references, and pre-academy award Jennifer Connelly. It just comes off as so genuine that I can't help but laugh when she stabs deep into some actress or child actor for just existing on screen. Skipping ahead some, she would then make a video on the top 11 dance crazes, which is just her and Nella kind of awkwardly dancing at random places. Nella! You bellowed? We have a mission to leave your friends. Sarah! We gonna go dance. Dance? Why? Well, at least consider it revenge for that horrible date you talked me into. I think you should give it a chance. So did you ever watch, like, G.I. Joe or something? <laughs> well, um, BFF Nella, we are going into public. Public? Public. For the top 11 embarrassing nostalgic dance crazes. Next, she would then review Xanadu. Shit on Don Bluth some more. Gosh, she had a hate pointer for Don Bluth. And pretty much called the movie a giant big-lipped alligator moment. Again, the big-lipped alligator moment joke was one of the worst ongoing memes a chick or anyone else ever came up with on thatguyoftheglasses.com. It's either this scene is random, the joke, or annoyingly, it was more often, lol, I have, or am pretending to have, terrible media literacy. And everyone on the site, well, at least most people on the site, use the same meme. Now after this, the next few videos follow a bit of a story arc for this series. The story arc opening with this intro about the Transformers cartoon. Hi, I'm your Nostalgia Chick, and in the history of ideas there are good ones, bad ones, and of course, evil genius. Let me posit this idea. Robots, 
awesome. Aliens, also awesome. Cars, pretty awesome, if a little planet destroying. Put the three together and what do you get? Hell yeah! But in the grand scheme of things that people have come up with to sell children, or man-children, this has got to be one of the most brilliant, if not... Oh, crap. Hi! Just what the hell you think you're doing? I'm talking about the silly toy franchise cartoon show about the robots that turn into cars. Yeah, uh, why do we hire you? To talk about girly things. And what are you not doing right now? This is hardly fair. What do you think you were doing dipping into my territory with that red Sonia bit? Alright, you cut this nonsense and get back to reviewing My Little Pony this instant! Let me just see if I can... Hey, I'm not done yet. I'm... Okay. Anyway, Transformers! So, she continues talking about Transformers and generally going over the premise of the show before the critic then manages to call back into her show. Oh, here we go. Ah! Honey... I'M ALREADY REVIEWING THE TRANSFORMERS MOVIE! No, not that Boom Fiesta, the slightly lesser known Boom Fiesta that came out in around 1986. Well, also dips! I didn't see any claims with it on the schedule, now if you'll excuse me a minute. This is my territory, and by God, I... Anyway, that movie. Transformers! This goes on a while longer, and she ends up reviewing the first animated Transformers movie, and generally goes over its plot, and makes the occasional quip along the way. It's an okay review, but man oh man, as someone who does not care at all about Transformers, this Transformers film looks like it was actually pretty decent with some amazing animation that I noticed she never ever brings up even once during this whole review. Actually, that was something else people generally never did, was talk about the animation of any of these films that they reviewed. She also made that one talking point every single person who ever reviews this type of stuff makes. You know the one. Man, this cartoon was made to sell toys. Therefore, it is creatively bankrupt apparently and isn't real art. Which is funny because, you know, these videos, the chicks videos and every other video on that site, but especially the chicks videos because she was hired on for this, was made specifically to make more money. But beyond that, it's kind of always been a weird talking point to me. Like yeah, movies, video games, books, and music are all made for people to pay for them to access them. And online videos are often made to get ad revenue. And I guess because there is any money in the motive of making art, I guess that means it can't possibly have any creativity or artistic intent or anything worth taking seriously because money was involved, I guess. Again, I know it's mostly just cynical commentary, but it's cynical commentary that I don't jive with. It's also just typical I hate capitalism talking points, but that's neither here nor there. But also, there's a more significant reason I'm focusing on the chick's talking points that I'll get into a bit later. Something that's been brewing under the surface of this whole series that I've never really seen anyone point out before. But before we jump into that, this video ends with this last skit where the chick talks with Michael Bay or, you know, someone pretending to be Michael Bay talking about his dumb Transformers film. It's an alright skit, I suppose, that eventually leads to the critic coming back and, well... What the? Hey! Oh, finally! And no, you can't have this one! No! <laughs> Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it, so you- <laughs> Yeah, this then leads into a two-parter, where the chick reviews Michael Bay's Armageddon, with nothing of note really going on in this video, besides the ongoing skit, of course, until the very end, where she says that she actually really loves reviewing 
dude stuff. That she likes reviewing it a lot. And that she likes it so much that she's gonna go frolic in a meadow now. Which she then proceeds to do. Only for the critic to be waiting for her. Watching her. He then knocks her out with a sleeping dart. And then proceeds to violently violate her mind, body, and soul. For daring to step on his territory. To flash fangs at the hand of the almighty nostalgia god. And then, right after, he kills her and uses her skin as a shawl and her organs and flesh as fresh meat to sustain him for the next couple of days, waiting for his next victim, the next poor, unfortunate soul, to find themselves in his clutches. Alright, not really, he just kidnaps her. This is then followed up in the next episode with this skit. Nostalgia chick. Nostalgia chick. <sighs> Douchey voice. Hey! Why do I keep being rendered unconscious by my many male nemeses? <laughs> we have ways of dealing with insubordinates who chloroform their employers. Then we get punished. <laughs> there is only one way out of this, and that is to go through it. You think you can escape reviewing awful girly venture? Well, you were wrong. <laughs> Dead wrong. Hi, I'm your nostalgia chick. And this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you. I hate the world. So the critic is forcing her to review girly stuff now, and yeah. You know, normally this is a situation that would happen in these types of reviews. Like Jason forcing AVGN to play the Friday the 13th game. Every reviewer back then had an episode or two, or a hundred, where they were being held hostage to watch a movie, or play a game, or read a comic, or something like that. But this is one of the few times I can think of where another critic was holding another critic hostage. So the chick goes through the Bratz movie, or at least tries to before then trying to escape, and well... I can't do it! I can't do it! You will never escape me. I am the master and you the subordinate. And you have been subjugated. Oh, where could I be? I guess I could be anywhere. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Sarah Connor? No. We'll hurt this anyway. Guess none of you want to know what I'm wearing. So she reviews the movie, and it seems like a pretty damn awful film. So her commentary fits fairly well with it. But of course, she then does try and escape once again. Lie. I'm fabulous and here's why. <laughs> Trying to escape again, are we? Oh, <laughs> you are feisty one. Well, I don't think you're gonna have Think about it. Do you really want to leave now in the middle of this bad movie? Yes! No, you don't! Yes! No, hear me out! Man, you can tell Doug was having so much fun with this. Actually, it looks like they are both having a ton of fun with these. At any rate, by episode's end, we get the conclusion to this little story arc. And, uh... You know you're in trouble, alright? So fuck this noise. It's done. It's over. I'm bouncing. Peace.
fucking okay. All right, let's speed up again here. Some other noteworthy videos from this time frame were a review of Mulan where she does enjoy the film but spends most of the review kind of seeming like she doesn't like it. A review of The Last Unicorn where the whole gimmick is where the chick and her friend are hiking through the whole thing and reviewing the film through uh, tired breaths. And it's such an awful fucking review. Like, between the really bad gimmick and the, I guess, one take for this thing, and the fact that yet again this masterpiece of a film gets shit on for no real good reason, and then we have this part where the chick actually does bring up the themes of the movie, and... <laughs> and, uh, basically says that I am the only unicorn to ever know what love is. Or regret. And so she leaves. And she goes back to her fort. And, uh, everybody has uh, lost their innocence, I guess. I don't know. It's very deep. Fucking, I guess. He was right there to actually talking about the movie and what makes it interesting and just disregards it as uh yes yeah, probably about fucking the loss of innocence or something like that i don't know fuck man why did this movie get fucked so hard every time it was reviewed on the site well anyway one of her other reviews from this time frame is actually one of the best that she's made up to this point in my opinion uh, that being her retrospective of sorts on the show Daria. She does have an ongoing skit during the review where she's kind of talking like Daria the whole time, but it's not too bad, and honestly hearing her praise the show and dive into what she really enjoys about it was, again, very refreshing, and hit on the core on several of the best aspects of the show. I ended up agreeing with her quite a lot during the course of the video. Which brings me to a bit of a revelation I had while going through all these old reviews of hers. Two revelations, in fact. The first of which being, holy shit, the nostalgia chick is Daria. Okay, not literally or totally, there's some important differences, but it did really click for me when I saw both how much she praised this show and how it seemed to be a series that helped in shaping the woman that she is today. Her sense of humor, perhaps even partly her outlook, or maybe these were always part of her outlook and sense of humor and Daria just really lined up with it super well. But therein lies an interesting difference. See, I love the show Daria. It's an all-time classic in my eyes and is super duper comfy. But in case it hasn't been made very clear by now, let me just lay my cards on the table. I don't really enjoy the majority of the Nostalgia Chick stuff. I've always found the cynical and sarcastic humor of Daria to be funny. And the thing is, Daria as a character was always very even-handed in her cynicism. No one was off limits, including herself. Whereas the Chick is very clearly coming from a certain perspective. And while I wouldn't want to speak for her, from what I understand and from what I've seen her argue for in these videos, it seems to be mostly from a feminism, literary theory type of angle. Mostly. And I suppose, truth be told, I just simply don't align with that form of media analysis. Hell, I'm not really a fan of looking at media through any super hyper-specific lens. Like, it's interesting, but I mostly find it annoying because usually these perspectives just kind of cherry pick aspects of a film or a piece of media and no matter what perspective it's coming from, be it feminist or Marxist or conservative or liberal or postmodern, etc. Again, while kind of interesting, always just feel like they're never fully understanding capturing or seeing the full picture of any given piece of art, but instead just kind of looking for things that pisses them off or aligns with their politics. Of course, I want to make sure I note that there's nothing wrong with analyzing media this way, and it's certainly made for an interesting niche that the chick fell into. I just personally find that I disagree with most of the conclusions these types of videos come to, and prefer a more all-encompassing or objective approach, with some subjectivity 
sprinkled in. On that note, while I highly disagree with most of her viewpoints and general opinions on film thus far, on an objective level there are some good qualities about these videos. Which leads me to Revelation 2, and getting back to that point of the thing brewing under the surface of this whole series. That again, I don't think I've ever really heard anyone point out about the Nostalgia Chick or Lindsay Ellis's work in general. That being that I believe she is one of the forerunners of the video essay genre. Now bear in mind, I've done a little bit of research into this, and there could be a few other people that maybe started doing video essays before Lindsay Ellis. But bear in mind, she started doing this around 2008 to 2009, and if there were anybody doing that, I certainly haven't found them yet. And regardless, I'd say it's safe to say that even if there were other people doing it, Lindsay Ellis was by far the most popular at this time of these types of video creators. Now, I say she's a forerunner in video essay genre because, while she does mostly do reviews at the beginning of her video career, there are still some elements even in her early work that can be found in what would eventually evolve into the video essay format. That usually being a video that is less about reviewing a thing and more so analyzing a thing. Sometimes a very specific aspect of a piece, like the art direction, cinematography, writing, characters, history, impact it had on the genre, etc. And of course, video essays don't have to be about media, it can be about, well, I guess anything theoretically. Bear in mind, her video essays in the beginning were certainly not the most detailed or well put together of their sort, but there is without a doubt a major difference between her style of writing and commentary and frankly nearly everyone else on the website. And this revelation was only further reaffirmed when I watched her video from this era entitled Nostalgia Chick Disney Princess, which would be her first actual fully video essay video with no review attached, with many more like it to come in the near future. This video talks about the archetype and idea of the Disney princess, and her many issues with it. She seems to hate the commercialism around the idea of the Disney princess, and the toys and merchandise surrounding it. She believes that the Disney princesses and the marketing around them indoctrinate children, little girls into having unrealistic body expectations, as well as pushes them into the wrong path of life, generally speaking, and gets them to think about boys and romance far too early in life. She also points out the tropes like the Disney princess wanting more or something and singing about it, and how she finds it very insidious to get little girls to fixate on romance so early in her life through these films. It almost seems to imply that this is the ultimate creative decision behind these types of characters from the start up until now, to indoctrinate, or some might even say groom, girls into this mindset. The term Disney princess has been around for a while, both in reference to the literal Disney princess as well as the archetype it represents. But in 2001, someone at the Disney company realized that this term was so ubiquitous that we might as well brand it and sell it. And sell it they did. Sales of Disney consumer products rose from 300 million in 2001 to 3 billion in 2006. 2009 looks to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 4 billion. In 10 years, there are over 25,000 products based on the franchise, including Pez dispensers, a blender, a shopping cart, buckets. The franchise even has a terrible song to go with it. There's a whole new world. It's a whole new world of indoctrination. But putting demographic aside for a moment, what does it really mean to be a Disney princess? I mean, besides being incredibly hot and having totally unrealistic body proportions. Criteria number two. You want something nondescript, and by God, you're gonna sing about it. Wait, 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 let's go back. The new princesses sing about something nondescript and don't really know what they want. The old princesses knew exactly what they wanted. I'm wishing, I'm wishing for the one I love. I think this is a shift in the sort of Hollywood 101 screenwriting. In the beginning, you want X thing, but then as the movie progresses, you learn you want something else. 
In the old Disney case, they knew what they wanted. They wanted to get married, and they got married. Cinderella was a little vague on her desires, but it's pretty clear that she just wants the handsome prince. The new brand of Disney princess doesn't realize she wants a man until she sees a man, and then she's like, whoa, that man is hot, I want it. Ariel wanted to be human and run around. Belle was really vague on what she wanted. I think she wanted to go on a road trip. Criteria number three, fairy tale ending. Love interest it really is the most important component since little girls are waiting on bated breath for their wedding day. I know I was when I was six. Fantasize about that fairy tale wedding, four-year-olds. Doesn't matter how young you are, you get those priorities in line early. Or in some cases, super early. Like Snow White, she's what, 13, 14? People get their weird on the aerial with 16, but Snow White didn't even have boobs yet. She was like this weird hybrid of baby and Victoria's Secret model. Aurora was 16 too, even though she doesn't look much like any 16-year-old I've ever seen. I think everyone else is of age at least, so yay for that. But really now, I think it's just something insidious about getting little girls to fixate on romance so early. I mean, this is one of those things that just freaking rules your life as an adult. Must we start on it before they've even got their short and curlies? All of which makes for a very interesting video that I absolutely, completely disagree with. For example, her point about Disney princesses or female leads having songs about wanting something usually something more. Well, I'm sorry to inform you, but uh, that's a musical storytelling 101, and is not at all exclusive to women or Disney princesses in these films either. There are plenty of songs from men protagonists wanting something more, and how they can't wait to be something, that they feel like there's something missing and that they need to find it. Oh, and would you look at that? Nearly every villain song in a Disney canon is about how they want something, or they're convincing someone to do something so that they can get that something that they want. It's almost like songs about wanting something more is not exclusive to Disney princesses, and is in fact a storytelling device in musicals. They can be found in literally every single one of them. What a interesting and bold and daring concept. This is of course never brought up by the chick, however, because if it is ever brought up, it would immediately break apart a key point in her video and the larger point that Disney princesses and characters like this are exploiting little girls through capitalism and targeted film direction, I guess. Uh, a case in point and why I really hate this form of analysis, especially when this same form of analysis is making the exact same points that a religious zealot would make about Disney films twisting the young minds of children with the devil or perversion. But you see, this is different because it's laced with feminist perspective instead of religious perspective. It's literally the exact same conclusion both based entirely on highly tailored and cherry-picked examples presented to the viewer without so much as a whiff of information that would dare break apart their thesis. She also talks about all these characters like they are all just females who want a man and nothing else. Which again is either terrible media literacy on her part or purposely ignoring other character motivations in said films for the sake of propping up this argument. And it's also worth noting that even with videos that in my opinion are made in extremely bad faith and are fairly easy to pick apart with a bit of research, it can also not be denied that much like Doug Walker and others on the site, Lindsay Ellis had a ton of pull with her opinions, which is interesting to reflect upon how she affected some talking points on the internet about media. For example, you know how everyone for a super long time and even now talks about the DreamWorks eyebrow? You know how in their posters there's always a character with one raised brow and what have you? Well, what if I told you Lindsay Ellis was the first one to ever make a video about this topic and more than likely is the origin point for why people ever notice this to begin with. These expressions that are all like, yeah, we're up to no good. Somehow this poster just doesn't feel very... Disney. The knowing smirk, eyebrows low and engaging the audience. The sardonic expression. I've seen this before. 
Where have I seen this before? Old Warner Brothers cartoons! How did you get in here? No, think about it! So, you have these things coming out of Disney, which are billed as funny, but are really just kind of sincere, simple, heartfelt, good, moral fun for the whole family. But what you're describing, the low production values, the slapsticky pain-based but, humor, the, but I was, the pop culture references... I, I was uh, talking about the dichotomy between Disney and... DreamWorks, and how did you get on this coat? No, but DreamWorks wasn't the first company to fill that role. And to be perfectly fair, it is probably one of her better videos from this time, and it's actually pretty interesting looking at how films were marketed, specifically animated films at that time, and how Disney differed from DreamWorks, and how the DreamWorks style is kind of what Disney ended up doing later on for marketing their films. I suppose what I'm saying is, is I may not always agree with her stuff, in fact I frequently, vehemently disagree with what she's saying in her video essays, but she does cover some pretty interesting topics from time to time, and uh, if, whether I agree or disagree with them, they do make for pretty uh, interesting watches and make for very interesting content to kind of come over and argue with and talk about. What's funny is, I remember back in the day when I used to watch nearly everyone on this site, that I actually did enjoy some of the chicks' stuff. I remember videos like the top 10 music videos of the 90s, first introducing me to one of my all-time favorite bands, The Smashing Pumpkins. To be fair, I kind of already knew about their music before then, I just didn't know what the name of the band was up to that point. Or her video on the top 10 viral videos from ancient internet, bearing in mind that that's ancient by 2012 standards, where she talks about a bunch of old internet videos and her nostalgia for them, which I'd be lying if I didn't say, kind of connected with me, and I found extremely interesting, especially as someone who grew up on the early internet or at least early 2000s internet. It was interesting hearing someone from a bit further back talking about what was popular then. But then again, maybe it's no surprise that such a video would be fascinating to me, considering the subject matters of this retrospective. And even the stuff that I very much disagree with her now on, I found at the very least fun at the time, since she was the first person I was aware of to bring up such points to me. She often reviewed or talked about stuff that I never heard of, much like Doug did, and I always found myself interested in what she had to say. I'd also like to note that if you do happen to enjoy her stuff, especially these old videos, and do happen to agree with her points, and do like this form of analysis, then that's perfectly fine. More power to you. But since this is my retrospective, I just wanted to make my feelings apparently clear. And if nothing else, I can at the very least respect her significance as a content creator. Before we move on though, I'd like to also point out a smaller video series that Lindsay once in a while did that was called Thanks for the Feedback, where she would, well, respond to feedback. And it was sort of a hit or miss show, sometimes having some of the chick characters more funny moments and other times being nothing really worth note. I do particularly like episode 1 where she responds to a comment about the nostalgia critic and her and how they should be a couple. The guy 54 says, I had an idea! You and nostalgia critic should date each other, please! Ah ha ha! No really though, I want to see what that would look like. Do eat! You guys are like meant for each other. Well, I wouldn't know but you each have nostalgia in your name so it's a connection! <laughs> Where do people even get this? I mean, when have I displayed even the remotest of attractions to him? He's all like, half full and beardy in you. Well, you two have a lot in common. Like what? He's nostalgic. You're nostalgic. You know, somehow I don't see a relationship based on when we have nothing to talk about but nostalgic shit. Oh my god! You and I haven't watched the My Little Pony movie in like three days. Which leads to this awkward little interaction where the two decide to go on a little date and find that they're pretty awkward and don't really have a whole lot in common besides liking nostalgic stuff. And later, they eventually try to get something to eat, but it seems Doug doesn't really want to go out in public with her so they decide to just eat some cereal at his house. 
There's this strange fixation on this Christmas tree as seen in the Christmas episode of Nostalgia Critic earlier on, and an almost Adult Swim skit type vibe going on at this dinner table scene, which leads into this golden moment. The way he calmly just turns it off without a fucking word always kills me. Eventually the critic has had enough and just screams at her and the two call the date off. So did you ever watch like G.I. Joe or something? <laughs> You're always asking me these questions! I'm not the answer man! I don't know everything! Don't you understand me? Don't you care? God! Of note I must say that anytime the critic shows up in the chick's videos, is usually a treat and fairly funny as they do seem to have some nice chemistry together. Another rather famous, or perhaps I should say infamous, episode of this series is the one called Rape Rap, which features a skit where the chick has this guy, a uh, supposed convicted rapist Brian, try and come up with a rap about rape. And it's, well, after all the time I had heard about it and heard it been brought up as this infamous piece of nostalgia chick lore and media, it's kind of just boring and not really funny. It's not funny because it's offensive, mind you, I, I could give two shits about that, but more so because it's kind of one note and never really goes anywhere. It's almost like they had the concept for this joke and then never were actually able to make the joke a reality. Yo, I'm sick of porno taping. I need it like a wild ape head. My penis is bent and misshapen. So I'm spending my nights out raping. Uh, that was good. Um, Brian, do you think we could make it a little less pro rape? You said that I could rap about rape. I did it my way. What's the problem? Okay, uh, let's try this again. With my hand on your mouth, cause I don't like noise. I just use cause I toys. And in your like a palm full of coys. But no teen witch cause I don't like boys. One last thing before moving on though. Later on in her three year anniversary of being a part of the channel, Lindsay notes why her later reviews became more analytical and more video essay and less a summary of the movie and joke based like they were in the beginning. But I was the one that was picked to do the Nostalgia Chick gig and uh, so basically um, you know they, they gave me a lot of freedom as to what I was allowed to do and was not and that, that sort of uh, evolved over the years and um, I think part of the reason it did evolve because I've seen a lot of people a lot of people say they prefer like this older style of review and this watching this God, it pains me. And it was just kind of funny because a lot of people are like, oh, I like your old stuff so much better. And I'm like, oh, but the sound, the sound. That was before I had a real microphone. Because, uh, like, honestly, the thing that pains me the most about these old episodes is not really even the writing or the sort of nervousness or how damn long it took. Like, this one took so long for me to do because I'd never done a review like this, which is kind of funny considering how quickly I can bang them out now. But I think I just... Um, I really kind of got tired of the format of, uh, I guess, s summarizing something while putting jokes, you know, punctuating it with jokes. And um, I understand, like, there's a huge market for that. Like, I'm, I'm not dissing the people that do do that, but whenever I kind of felt like uh, it was becoming more commonplace, that was when I kind of started to drift away from it. Because my, f my favorite stuff isn't really the summarizing stuff anyway. I, 
feel like it's more interesting whenever it's more analytical and uh, has an opinion rather than just kind of making fun of something. And that also, I think, is a direct result of having gone to film school over those three years is I find it much, much harder to just kind of point fingers and make fun of something now that I know what goes into making it. But to each his own, I think, uh, at the end of the day, I just, I, I don't plan on going back to this style of review, nor do I see why I would, but, uh... Which I actually completely agree with her on. Even if I often disagree with her opinions, I vastly prefer content that has something to say and dives a bit deeper into media versus the summary-based stuff that so much of the internet was full of at this time. And I definitely think her most interesting stuff was and always has been when she's being more analytical. And later in her career, she would go on to fully and exclusively make longer form video essays about, well, pretty much everything, which we'll talk about another time. But for now, I think that's enough talking about the Nostalgia Chick, as I'm sure you've gotten a pretty good taste of what her early content was, her general evolution from nostalgia critic female to video essayist, her influence and my general opinion on her content. The Nostalgia Chick, one of the first video essayists ever to exist, a true innovator in her field, and a member of ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com or Channel Awesome that would go on to have some of the largest success online, as well as a woman with some of the absolute worst fucking takes on animation and musicals that I, uh, ever have had the displeasure of watching. But now that we've gotten the chick out of the way, the second build person on the site, I believe it's only fair and logical that we now move on to the third build person on the site. A rabbit hole of internet history of drama, and endless amounts of videos to come through. I am of course talking about the man with the fedora, the bringer of light himself, the comic crucifier, the one and only. Linkara. And that is it ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you enjoyed this part too of the Channel Awesome Retrospective. And if you made it to the end of this video, be sure to like and subscribe and share the video if you wish. It's always very much appreciated. I put a lot of time and passion and hard work into these videos, so any little bit helps. Which, speaking of, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members, including all of my Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as a super special thank you to all of my great Night Owls, including Channel 11, Hex Maniac Hannah, Tony Teramaya, Ho Hot, Medusa's Hex, Sharif, Tyler the Leper, and Star Punch Gaming, as well as an ultra mega super duper special thank you to all of my Arch Owls, including the Gun Toten Thursday 14, the Fearless Forgotten Ace, the Super Saiyan Sword, the Aspiring Animator Cherry NGT, and the Chi Vibes Zen Garden Party. Thank you all so very, very much for watching this video and continuing to support the channel any way that you can. Also, once again, this is yet another reminder that I have a Discord server which you can join down below. And of course, if you wish to become a channel member or join my Patreon, you can look forward to several exclusive videos coming up very soon as well as early access to all my current big video projects. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl flying off.